lords, of all the cares that tend upon our crown, that which hath grieved us most until this hour hath been that very instrument of order which was devised for our chiefest comfort. I mean this council board, which should have been the prop and center of our government, but which, by cruel dissent and emulation, hath bred a thousand still lamented sorrows within my kingdom and my unquiet soul. Therefore, my lords, upon the queen's advice, we have new filled these places, lately voided by foreign absence or untimely death, with such a kind of gentle counselor as only is ambitious for our good. Therefore, good gentlemen, we welcome you, Lord Say, Lord Clifford, and your valiant son, and you, Sir Humphrey Stafford. Welcome all. Have you no welcome for your princely son? In sooth I have. Most welcome, gentle Edward. Mark our proceedings well, for in good time I mean to seat thee in thy father's chair, whilst I myself do lead a private life and in devotion spend my latter days. Yet till that our devotion must be rendered unto your vexed state. I mean to do so. Then, lords, I pray you, take your places all. Say then, how fares the Duke of York in Ireland? With good success, the rebels are confounded. Would that this news were matched with that from France, for there rebellion thrives, and Somerset sends in the desperate posts for present help. Shall we not send the Duke of York to aid him? I would we might, but tis impossible that he should ever join with Somerset. And yet tis safest that the Duke be hence. What is reported since he grew so great, that there's much stirring of those ancient questions touching his title to the English throne. Alas, how many troubles do attend us. What may be done, good wife? Look on this boy, and let his manly face, which promiseth successful fortune, steal thy manly heart to hold thine own and leave thine own with him. What unkind man should stir this claim of yours? <laughs> Who but his greater lie? The Earl of Warwick. It cannot be, for Warwick loves us well. He never did us harm, but like a dove has ever been a bird of peace to us. Who cannot steal a shape that means deceit? Seems he a dove. His feathers are but borrowed, for he's disposed as the hateful raven. Why is he absent now? But for contempt, or else for tending on some present mischief. In truth, he is much changed. And full of danger. For though he be no better than an earl, he dare not calm his contumelious spirit that looks to be an arrogant controller of us of ours and every soul in england madam no more of this for tis that tune you sung before against my uncle gloucester which like the siren song did wreak my <laughs> rack thou shalt be tempest tossed if thou avoid it for here's the boreas may blow thee down good morrow to your honours uh, pardon me, I had not come so late, but for some mischief that is new broached against your highness state. What mischief, Warwick? Who hath broached it? The commoners of Kent are up in arms, stirred up by one... I whom, my lord, his name? Jack Cade of Ashford, <laughs> madam, what of that? They claim redress against certain sharp abuses which they conceive are practised by this council, against your domains of England and of France. Didst thou not set them on? Why should I so? Nay, rather, I persuaded them to fashion a schedule of their several grievances and promised to convey it to the king. And what answer think you we should make to them? The shortest and the best. Cut off their heads. <laughs> and may God forbid so many simple souls should perish by the sword. Were it not best to send some holy bishop to entreat them? If thou entreatest, make thy instrument a kirtle axe and not a crucifix. Let's woo them first and make reserve of force. Sir Humphrey Stafford, do you go to them and tell them if they once lay down their arms, the king will answer to their grievances and let them know that if they will not so, they shall be plagued for it. I will, my lord. Madam, doubt not I know the meetest way to handle such a kind of ruffian. About it, then. Lord Say, stay here with us. The rebels hate thee and would have thy head. So might his highness person be in danger, and therefore in the city will I stay and live alone. As secret as I may. My lords, the Kentish men draw near to London. 
Jack Cade proclaims himself Lord Mortimer and calls your grace usurper openly. The rascal people, thirsting after prey, join with the traitor, and they jointly swear to spoil the city and your royal court. Poor graceless men, they know not what they do. Ah, uh, where the Duke of Suffolk now alive, these Kentish rebels had been soon appeased. I fear me, love, if that I had been dead, thou wouldst not have mourned so much for me. No, love, I should not mourn. But die for thee. Beseech your majesties to linger not, but with the prince, ride hence to Killingworth. My father and myself will muster men, that if Sir Humphrey's words may not prevail, our swords may woo them. God forbid, good Clifford. My liege, if we may win them without blows, why then we will. Yet arms must answer arms. Then haste, my lords, and gather up your powers. Come, king, when we are hence, then mayst thou pray. Well, I will hence unto the Duke of York, and bid him fetch his army to our aid. What need of that? The Cliffords are our succor. Aye, they and God. Come, Exeter, with us. Clifford, farewell. Trust not these Kentish rebels. Trust nobody, for fear you be betrayed. Nor you, my lord, for many traitors throng you. The trust I have is in my innocence, and therefore am I bold and resolute. Heaven preserve thee in thine innocence. And yet methinks it will be shook anon. For if Jack Cade, whom I myself did raise, thrive not in this, I'll rouse Plantagenet. For now, the house of York, thrust from the crown by lofty, proud, encroaching tyranny, burns with revenging fire, whose hopeful colors advance his half-faced sun, striving to shine. It was I that made his spring, and now his summer shall flourish by my means and my direction. Then, since I may no longer sway the council, tis swords must now uphold my policies. Then, York, be king and prosper as you may. Whate'er befalls, tis I shall bear the sway. <laughs> We are much, for my spirit moveth me to make a proclamation. I'm seeing the move to make water. I like not this marching. We, John Cade, Cade, so termed of our supposed father, thou, our enemy, shall fall before us, inspired with a spirit of putting down kings and princes. <laughs> Silence! 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 My father was a Mortimer. He was an honest man. And a good bricklayer. My mother a Plantagenet. I knew her well. She was a midwife. Therefore am I of an honourable house. Aye, by my faith, the field is honourable. And there was he born under a hedge. I fear neither sword nor fire. Be brave, then, for your captain is brave, and bars reformation! <laughs> there shall be in England seven half-penny loaves for a penny! <laughs> and I will make it a felony to drink small beer. <laughs> All the realm shall be in common. And in Cheapside shall my palfrey go to grass. <laughs> and when I am king, as king I will be. God save your majesty. God save your majesty. God save your majesty. God save your majesty. I thank you, good people. There shall be no money. No money. All shall eat and drink on my score. <laughs> and I will apparel you all in one livery that ye may agree like brothers and worship me, your Lord. The first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers. <laughs> That I mean to do. 
is not it a lamentable thing that the skin of an innocent lamb should be made parchment? Mm -hmm. That parchment being scribbled o'er should undo a man. Shame! 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 Oh, now, who's here? The clerk of Jenham. He can read and write. Oh, monstrous! We took him setting a boy's copy. Here is a villain! Come hither, sirrah. I must examine thee. <laughs> what is thy name? Emmanuel. <laughs> they used to write it at the top of letters. We'll go hard with you. Let me alone. Dost thou used to write thy name? Or hast thou a mark to thyself like any honest, plain-dealing man? Oh, Sir, I thank God I have been so well brought up that I can write my name. <laughs> <laughs> Away, I say, hang him with his pen and ink <laughs> about his neck. <laughs> Where's our general? Here I am, thou particular fellow. Fly, fly, fly! Sir Humphrey Stafford's our by with a monstrous proclamation. He shall be encountered with one as good as himself. He is but a knight, as I. Ah. To equal him, I will make myself a knight. Rise up, Sir John Mortimer. <laughs> <laughs> Rebellious hinds, the filth and scum of Kent, <laughs> marked for the gallows. Lay your weapons down. Home to your cottages. Forsake this groom. The king is merciful if you relent, but angry, wrathful, and inclined to blood if you go forward. Therefore yield, or die. As for this scarlet-coated slave, I pass not. It is to you, good people, that I speak, over whom in time to come I hope to reign, for I am rightful heir unto the English crown, being descended from Lord Mortimer. Mortimer! 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 Jack Cade, the Duke of York hath taught you this. He lies, for I invented it myself. Go to, sirrah, tell the king for me, that for his father's sake, Henry V, I am content that he should reign, but I'll be protector over him. I'll tell him this, but look to suffer for it. Nay, no, I warrant you, I'd rather look to thrive. <laughs> Herald away, and throughout every town proclaim them traitors that are up with Cade, and that each man who not lay down his arms shall, even in his wife's and children's sight, be hanged up for example at his doors. Stay, Stafford! For I mean to make example too. Yeah. Yeah. What say you all? As we are king, are not these threats a treason to us all? Ah, yeah. 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 And shall we not punish the traitor that utters it? Hang yeah. 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 Hanging is for honest men. <laughs> <laughs> Come hither. Fellow. Ah. What? Did you murder me? Nay, sir, uh, I rather mean to weed you. <laughs> <laughs> Why think you that we bear bills and hooks and hoes? We are a kind of gardeners to the common will. <laughs> and mean no greater harm than we do. <laughs> Therefore, Sir Humphrey, <laughs> content yourself, for you must be plucked out. I'll be the first to do so, <laughs> for, for I fear no nettles. Here's <laughs> 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 for thee. <laughs> <laughs> His body shall be dragged at my horse's heels, 
Till we reach London. I will have the mayor's sword born before you. As we mean to thrive and do good, let's break open the jails and let out all the prisoners. <laughs> Nay, fear not that I warrant you. Come, let's march towards London. <laughs> the Duke of Somerset with France. I claim the tribute due unto my king, which Charles the Dauphin, thy deceased father, did swear to render us. Perchance he swore it, but I did not, and that was long ago. As thou inherited his crown and kingdom, thou art inheritor unto his oaths. Why need you tribute? But to pay your soldiers to shed the blood of mine own countrymen. I shed no blood of those that keep the truce, but of such traitors, you yourself sit on to make revolts within our territory. If they revolt, tis not at our behest, but for they hate your buzzard garrison. They owe allegiance to the King of England, and did acknowledge him their lawful king by right descent, and by the will of heaven. What and they did? Tis not allegiant oaths, nor lawful title can uphold a king in this bad world, where oaths of mickle might are broached and broke a hundred times a day. <laughs> Thinks thou I bear the sway by such light sanctions? Nay, I am hallowed in my people's hearts, and do command such earthly pure sense as daily waxeth while your English wanes. I am more strong in France than Henry is, I am more loved in France than Henry is, and owe more loyalty than Henry doth. These are my sanctions. Until he commands such strength, such love, such loyalty and gallia, let him not ask for tribute. Tell thy master. Oh, perjured Frenchman, dare you break your oaths? Do you not fear that God will plague you for it? I know not that, but certain you may not. I may and will. Come, these are idle threats. And thou shouldst rather think thee fortunate, I do not threaten thee as well I might and seize upon your vexed territories. Your oath once broke. What warranty have I that when you will, you may not yet attempt it? What need have I to march against your powers? I nothing doubt your king will soon remove them to underprop his own beleaguered walls, rather than make vain battery of mine. Meantime, we suffer you to linger, a tedious, churlish, and unwelcome guest whom we will lodge, but do not mean to feed. Whom, if you plain, we do not mean to heed. And whom, when you remove, we will not mourn, but speed you hence with slight contempt and scorn. For when thou art in England, thy mischance is like to prove more fatal than in France. Damn it! Conqueror and Lord of London! <laughs> and here I charge and command that of the city's cost, the pissing condit shall run nothing but claret wine <laughs> the first year of our reign. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> and now, henceforward, it shall be treason for any that calls me other than Lord Mortimer. Mortimer! <laughs> <laughs> Knock him down there. This fellow be wise, he'll never call you Jack Cade more. I think he hath a very fair warning. <laughs> <laughs> There's an army gathered in Smithfield. Come then, let's go fight for them. <laughs> but first, set London Bridge on fire. <laughs> And if you can, burn down the tower, too. <laughs> burn all the records of the realm. My mouth shall be the parliament of England. The proudest peer in the realm shall not wear a head upon his shoulders unless he pay me tribute. And there shall not a maid be married 
but she shall pay to me her maidenhead ere they have it. <laughs> and here I charge and command that men's wives shall be as free <laughs> as your tongue wish or tongue can tell. <laughs> Up this street, dance at Magnus Corner. <laughs> Oh, what noise is this? Dare any be so bold to sound a parley with us? <laughs> well, we have a proven course with ambassadors. <laughs> Let them come. <laughs> no, Cade. We come ambassadors from the king. And to the Collins whom thou hast misled, and here pronounce free pardon unto all that will forsake thee and go home in peace. <laughs> <laughs> Who loves the king? And will embrace his pardon, bring up his cap and say, God save his majesty. <laughs> <laughs> what say ye, countryman? Will ye relent and yield to mercy whilst he's offered you? <laughs> God save his majesty. <laughs> My Lord Clifford's, <laughs> are you both so brave? <laughs> and you base peasants, do you believe them? Will you needs be hanged with your pardons about your necks? I thought you'd never given out your arms till you had recovered your ancient freedom. But you are all recreants and dastards and delight to live in slavery to the nobility. Let them break your backs with burdens, take your houses over your heads, ravish your wives and daughters before your faces. For me, I will make ship for one, and so God's curse light upon you all. Mortimer! Is Cade the son of Henry the Fifth? That thus you do exclaim your go with him? Will he conduct you through the heart of France and make the meanest of you, earls and dukes? <laughs> Alas, he had no home, no place to fly to, nor knows he how to live but by the spoil, unless by robbing of your friends and us. Were it not a shame that whilst you live at Jar, the fearful French whom you late vanquished should make a start or a seize and vanquish you. The things already in a civil broil, I see them lording it in London streets, crying, Filiago! Uh, and to all they meet, better ten thousand baseborn canes miscarry than you should stoop unto a Frenchman's mercy uh, to uh, France, to France, and get what you have lost. Spare England, for it is your native coast. A Clifford! Was ever feather so lightly blown to and fro as is this multitude? The name of Henry V hails them to a hundred mischiefs and makes them leave me desolate. <gasps> Go, oh, some of you, and follow him. And he who brings his head unto the king shall have a thousand crowns for his reward. <laughs> follow me, fellows, unto Killingworth. My son and I will seek a gentle means to reconcile you all unto the king. <laughs> That good Somerset. Is France quite lost? All but some few besieged towns. My liege, thy subjects all the seas reject thee quite, and do acknowledge Louis for their king. Mass. What boots it thee to cry, alas? What else remains? To rouse thyself. If not for thee, then for this prince's rights. Good father, take this comfort for thy cares. When I am king, I'll gain what you have lost. <laughs> Ned. Methinks in thee my father's spirit doth new arise. I think it doth, good father, and while I live, our house shall hold its own. Health and glad tidings to your majesty. What news, my lord? 
Is Cade discomfited? Aye. He has fled, and all his powers do yield. And humbly thus, with halters on their necks, expect your highness doom of life or death. What shall be done with these abhorred traitors? <laughs> they have their halters, and shall hang in them. That were to break my oath. My doom is mercy, and to be mild unto these yielding men. Here comes the Duke of Exeter. Let me grant he bring no worse news than these have done. And certain news whose meaning I misdoubt. The Duke of York is newly come from Ireland. Doth he intend us harm? I fear he does. Aye, for the Duke hath not discharged his men. And Warwick and his powers are gone to meet him. Ned, I fear for thine inheritance. So do not I. As cheerful sounding to my youthful spleen, this tumult is of war's increasing broils. As of the coronation of a king, the joyful clamours of the people are when Ave Caesar they pronounce aloud. What think you then that it is best to do? What needs this question? March to London straight and make demand of these insulting peers that they dismiss their dangerous mercenaries. That done, make study how to govern better. Burn you your holy books and hold the sway to London lords with all expedient wing and make York bow before his lawful king. Ireland, thus comes York to claim his right. Ring bells aloud, burn bonfires clear and bright to entertain great England's lawful king. Ah, Sancta Majestas, who would not buy thee dear? Let them obey that know not how to rule. My hand was made to handle naught but gold. A scepter shall it have, have I a soul, on which I'll toss the flower de luce of France. Welcome, brave lord. We thank thee, mighty Warwick. Says the hour not arrived when I may openly advance my right. It is. The realm is now so vilely rent that thou and I, with our conjoined powers, may pluck the crown from feeble Henry's head. Now speaketh Warwick plain before the world what once was privily and darkly spoke. Thou art my king, and here before our hosts I kneel in sign of true allegiance. Now walk to London. Set thy standard up, and in the same advance the milk white rose. And on my own I'll bear my father's crest, the rampant bear chained to the ragged staff. Aloft my colours and my burgonet, and mock any lord of Henry's blood. To London, then, to seize upon mine own, my crown, my sceptre, and my regal throne. days have I hit me in these woods, durst not peep out, for the country is laid for me. But now am I so famished that if I might have a lease of my life for a thousand years, I could hide no longer. Ah, villain, uh, thou wilt betray me. My rude companion, whatsoever thou be, I know thee not, why then should I betray thee? 
It's not enough to break into my garden, but thou wilt brave me with these saucy terms. Brave thee? Thou look on me well. I've eaten no meat these five days. But come thou and thy five men, and I'll leave you as dead as a doornail. Nay, never shall be said while England stands that Alexander Iden and his squire of Kent took odds to combat a poor famished man. <laughs> if my arm be heaved in the air, thy grave is digged already in the earth. By my valor, the most complete champion that ever I heard. Oh, make me eat iron like an ostrich and swallow my sword like a great pen. <laughs> place for all that do dwell in this house, for the unconquered soul of Cain is fled. This Cain that I have slain, that monstrous traitor. I farewell, be proud of thy victory. Tell Kent for me she hath lost her best man, for I that never feared any have vanquished my famine. And not what? Well. Die, damned it, wretch. The curse of her that bare thee. Hence will I drag thee, drained of rebel blood, unto a dunghill which shall be thy grave, and there cut off thy most ungracious head, leaving thy trunk for crows to feed upon. of the fearful king. And this, the regal seat. Possess it, York. Assist me then, sweet Warwick, and I will. Plantagenet is planted. Root him up who dares. By words or blows, I will maintain my right. Tis best by words, if that be possible. So thou mayst rule by general consent. Then let our first assault be made against the conscience of the king. Then, sirs, withdraw, but be in readiness. <laughs> Queen this day here holds her parliament. Little thinks we shall be of her council. Neither the queen, the Cliffords, nor the rest dare stir a wing if Warwick shake his bells. My lords, look where the traitorous rebel sits, even in the chair of state. Belike he means back by the power of Warwick, that false peer, to aspire unto the crown and reign as king. Why, what a pair of traitors have we here? Why, Warwick, has thy knee forgot to bow? Oh, where is faith? Oh, where is loyalty? For shame and duty bend thy knee to me. Attend me, king. 
for I've held peace too long. King did I call thee? No, thou art not king, nor fit to govern and rule multitudes. Thy hand was made to grasp a palmer's staff, not to grace an awful princely scepter. Here's a hand to hold a scepter, up, and with the same to act controlling law. What shall we suffer this? Let's pluck him down. Oh, gracious Lord, let us assail this traitor that dares to do dishonor to your throne. He durst not sit there had your father lived. Far be the thought of this from Henry's heart to ban and brawl before the chair of state. Thou factious Duke of York, descend my throne and kneel for grace and mercy at my feet. I am thy sovereign. Thou art deceived. I am thine. Will you we show our title to the crown? If not, our sword shall prove it in the field. What title hast thou, traitor to the crown? I am the son of Henry V. Whose father got the crown by right of conquest. Peace, Lord, and give this Henry leave to speak. Plantagenet shall speak first. Hear him, lords, and be you silent and attentive too. Think thou that I will leave my kingly throne wherein my grandsire and my father sat. His title's good, a better far than yours. Then prove it, Henry, and thou shalt be king. Henry the Fourth, by conquest, got the crown. It was by rebellion against his king. I know not what to say. My title's weak. Tell me, may not a king adopt an heir? And if he may? Then I am lawful king, for Richard, in the view of many lords, resigned his crown to Henry the Fourth. He rose against him, being his sovereign, and made him to resign his crown for force. Uh, didst thou not swear allegiance unto me? I did. Canst thou dispense with heaven for such an oath? It is great sin to swear unto a sin, but greater sin to keep a sinful oath. Who can be bound by any solemn vow to do a murderous deed, to rob a man, to force a spotless virgin's chastity, and to have no other reason for these wrongs but that he was bound by a solemn oath? Will none else speak for me? My lord of Exeter, what sayest thou to my claim? Methinks thou art just and impartial in affairs of state. Tell me your mind. I am most loath to speak it. For though thou art king, if rule by right descent be held true sanction of a monarch's right, I must confess your title's indirect. And York's more lawful and legitimate. But, lords, consider. If we should proceed by strict observance of all lawful form, what kingly title ever could withstand some delving question of the doubtful past? Methinks that what was done by Bolingbroke was darkly done, but nevertheless was done. And what's long done is best to hold unto. England has bled too long for Richard's death. Oh, then conclude what's past is past repair. And honor Henry now as Richard's heir. Aye, what care I to pry into the past? King Henry, be thy title right or wrong, the Clifford's vow to fight in thy defense. Do right unto this princely Duke of York, or I will raise this house with fire and sword and o'er the chair of state where now he sits. Write up his title with usurping blood. My lord of Warwick, hear me but one word. Let me for this my lifetime reign as king. Confirm the crown to me and to mine heirs, and thou shalt reign in quiet while thou livest. I am content. Richard Plantagenet, 
Be thou protector whilst I am alive, and enjoy the kingdom after my decease. What wrong is this unto the prince, your son? Come, father, let us tell the queen these news. Farewell, faint-hearted and degenerate king, in whose cold blood no spark of honor bides. In dreadful war mayst thou be overcome, or live in peace, abandoned and despised. Turn this way, Henry, and regard them not. Oh, Exeter. Why should you sigh, my lord? Not for myself, Lord Warwick, but for my son, whom I unnaturally shall disinherit. But be that as it may, I here entail the crown to thee and to thine heirs forever, conditionally, that here thou take an oath to cease this civil war, and whilst I live, to honor me as thy king and sovereign. This oath I willingly take and will perform. Long live King Henry. Plantagenet, embrace him. Thus York and Lancaster are reconciled. Long live thou and all thy princely house. Farewell, my gracious lord. I'll to my castle. And I'll keep London with my soldiers. And I, with grief and sorrow, keep my court. Here comes the queen. Wretched man. Would I had died a maid, and never seen thee, never born thee, son, seeing thou hast proved so unnatural a father. Hast thou but loved him half so well as I, or felt that pain which I did for him once, thou wouldst have left thy dearest heart blood there, rather than have made that savage duke thine heir, and disinherited thine only son. Father. You cannot disinherit me. If you be king, why should not I succeed? Pardon me, Margaret. Pardon me, sweet son. The Earl of Warwick and the Duke enforced me. Enforced thee? Art thou king and wilt be forced? Ashamed to hear thee speak, a timorous wretch. Thou hast undone thyself, thy son, and me, and given unto the house of York such head as thou shalt rule but by their sufferance. To entail him and his heirs unto the crown, what is it but to make thyself a sepulchre and creep into it far before thy time? Warwick, his chancellor, and the lord of Callis, the duke is made protector of the realm, and yet shalt thou be safe. Such safety finds the trembling lamb environed with wolves. Had I been there, which am a silly woman, the soldiers should have tossed me on their pikes before I would have granted to that act. But thou preferst thy life before thine honor. And seeing thou dost, I here divorce myself, both from thy table, Henry, and thy bed, until that vow to York shall be revoked, whereby my son is disinherited. The northern lords that have forsworn thy colours will follow mine if once they see them spread, and spread they shall be to thy foul disgrace and utter ruin of the house of York. Thus do I leave thee. Come, son, let's go. Gentle son, Edward, thou wilt stay with me. When I return with victory from the field, I'll see your grace. Till then, I'll follow her. Our arm is ready. Come, we'll follow it. Yeah! Therefore, listen to me. 
I am the strongest. Look, you heed me well. But George can better play the auditor. My pretty brothers mark my argument, for I have reason, strong and forceful. <laughs> Though I be youngest, I have reason. Colonel, sons. What is your quarrel? Who began it first? Oh, no quarrel, but a slight contention. Upon what cause, good Edward? That cause which doth concern your grace and us. The crown of England, father, which is yours. Mine, boy. <laughs> not till King Henry be dead. Your rights depends not on his life or death. Now you are heir, therefore enjoy it now. By giving the House of Lancaster leave to breathe, it will outrun your father in the end. Think you how sweet it is to wear a crown within whose circuit is Elysium and all the poets feign of bliss and joy. <laughs> I gave an oath that he should quietly reign. But for a kingdom, any oath may be broken. I will break a thousand oaths for reign one year. No. God forbid your grace should be forsworn. Ah, I shall be, if I claim by open war. I'll prove the contrary if you'll hear me speak. Thou canst not, son. It is impossible. An oath is of no moment being not took before a true and lawful magistrate that hath authority over him that swears. Henry had none, but did usurp the place. Then seeing twas he that made you to depose, your oath, my lord, is vain and frivolous. Therefore to arms, why do we linger thus? I cannot rest until the white rose that I wear be dyed, even in the lukewarm blood of Henry's heart. It would be nothing. I will be king. Be patient. Ah, uh, what news? The Queen! Though the Northern Isles are lords, the boy with Somerset and both the Cliffords intend here to besiege you in your castle. They are hard by with 20,000 men. What? Thinks thou that we fear them? No, I am glad on it. Since Henry's oath is broken, mine is void, and we may shed their blood without dishonor. Let's meet them in the field. What? With 5,000? Oh, woman, General, what are we to fear? I hear their guns! Let's set our men in order and issue forth and bid them battle straight! I meant the twenty! Though the odds be great, I doubt not father of our victory! Nor I! Many a battle have I won in France, when as the enemy have been ten to one. Why should we not now have like success? Farewell, good husband and my sons. Brave Edward, thou Richard, and my gentle George, God grant you victory and happy day. Sun trumpets! Let our bloody colors wave! And I the victory! Or else a grave. traitorously surrendered the realm of France, which was my kingly father's. What should the king beget so vile a brat? Ah, Somerset, speak not so in spite, or you shall sup with Jesus Christ tonight. <laughs> oh, magic. That's more than thou canst tell. If not in heaven, you will surely sup in hell. Crestfallen Somerset. Mine is mine! The Lancaster will bear! Now, now, thou coward, George! Thou rascal brother, full of my heart on future mischief, said I would speak blasphemy ere bid you fly. But fly we must, the Clifford's rage like two enchanted bulls, and smite our fearful and resistless soldiers. We shared them on with justice of our cause, all in vain, they've no heart to fight. Now is it manhood, wisdom, and defense to get the enemy way? And to secure us, then we shall leave our father thy sin. We remain when all the rest are fled, our house will perish quite. But if we escape, happily we may avenge our father's death. Happily we may bring rescue if we haste. 
Let's run it as we can. They will not hear us. Say, will you retire and leave your father while he, renowned noble gentleman, yield up his life unto a world of odds? I don't know what to do, know where to turn. My mind is dizzy for much loss of blood. No matter what will be done in haste. Let's find out those we may and then advise us. A curse upon the Clippers and our soldiers. A curse on my own son that Ray, their father. Aim and confusion. All is on the routes. Fear frames disorder and disorder wounds where it should guard. Son of hell, whom angry heavens do make their minister. Throw in the frozen bosom of our heart hot coals of vengeance. Let no soldier fly. We cannot stay. Hey. Father! Make retire and keep thee from the tempest of the field. Hey. We should see the bottom of all our fortunes, which in a mistake may shine again when Warwick's powers become. I will not fly. And thou and I alone shall keep the field. Sir? Sir? <laughs> Richard! <laughs> Let us seek the Cliffords. God knows how long it is I have to live, but whilst I breathe, I mean to meet with them. Or son or father, that their houses' blood may pay a recompense unto my sword. <laughs> Clifford of Cumberland, tis Richard calls. Now when the angry trumpet sounds alarm, and dead men's cries do fill the empty air, come forth, I say. Why do you shun my steel? The Clifford hands! For both the Richards call you a Clifford, hence a Duplan Tangenet! Clifford! Oh, ruffian York! What was thou, you good greybeard? Break a lance? Hey, Richard, single out some other chase, for I do mean to hunt this deer to death. Then do it, father. I'll go seek his son. Ah! Oh, can I find him? This day may yet be one! Why dost thou pause, old York, to look upon old Clifford? With thy brave bearing shall I be in love, but that thou art so fast mine enemy. Nor should thy prowess want praise and esteem, but that is shown if nobly and in treason, and that I'll prove against thy sword. <laughs> Thus war hath given me peace, for thou art still. Peace with his soul, heaven, if it be thy will. Where are my sons? Oh, but I find them out. The sands are numbered that make up my life. Where's my father? Clifford calls on Clifford, that we may share the glory of this day. Who's this? Oh, heavens. Let the vile world end, and bid the general trumpet blow his blast. Particularities and petty sounds to cease. Even at this sight my heart is turned to stone, and while tis mine it shall be stony. York, not our old men spares. No more will I their banes. Tears virginal shall be to me even as the dew to fire henceforth. I will not have to do with pity. Surprise, <laughs> my lord. The chick of York. Oh, no. Who art thou, boy? The Earl of Rutland and 
been summoned to the rightful king of England. Ah, <laughs> oh, gentle Clifford, do not look so fiercely. I never did thee harm. Why wilt thou slay me? Thy father slew my father. Thou shalt die. Oh, let me pray before I take my death. This is a child that does not murder him. Sweet Clifford, pity me. Stay, my lord, be merciful. Thou dost hold her grace. I have no grace. My soul is in my sword. Thy father slew my father. Therefore... So, perish all thy brood beneath mine edge. Plantagenet, I come, Plantagenet, and this, thy son's blood cleaving to my blade, shall rust upon my weapon till thy blood congealed with this to make me wipe off both. Bear hence the bodies and pursue the flyers. And soldiers, show what cruelty you can, that their fell deaths may never be forgot. Away, and seek we out Plantagenet. of the queen has got the field all my followers to the eager foe turn back and fly like ships before the wind my son god knows what hath the chance of them three times did richard make a lane to me and cry a crown or else a glorious tomb a scepter or an earthly sepulchre. With that we charged again, but out alas we bodged again. As I have seen a swan with bootless labor swim against the tide and spend her strength with overmatching waves. Oh, ah. The fatal followers to pursue, and I am faint and cannot fly their fury. Come, bloody Clifford. Come, thou fateful queen. I am your butt, and I abide your shot. Yield to our mercy, proud Pantagenet. I to such mercy as his ruthless arm with downright payment showed unto my father. What will your grace have done unto him now? Come, make him stand upon this molehill here that watered mountains with outstretched arm, yet parted but the shadow with his hand. My ashes, as the phoenix, may bring forth a bird that will revenge upon you all. And in that hope I raise mine eyes to heaven, scorning whate'er you can afflict me with. What? Was it you that would be England's king? Was you that reveled in our parliament? and made a preachment of your high descent? Where is your mess of sons to back you now? The wanton Edward and the lusty George? And where's that valiant crook-backed prodigy, Dicky, your boy, that with his grumbling voice was wont to cheer his dad in mutinies? And with the rest, where is your darling? Look, York, I stained this napkin with the blood that valiant Clifford with his rapier's point made issue from the bosom of the boy. <laughs> and if thine eyes can water for him now, I give thee this to dry thy cheeks with all. <laughs> Poor York, but that I hate thee deadly, I should lament thine miserable state. For pretty he grieved to make me merry, York, but that thy fiery heart so parched thine entrails that not a tear can fall for Watland's death. 
<laughs> Why art thou patient, man? Thou shouldst be mad, and I to make thee mad do mock thee thus. Stamp, rave, and threat, that I may sing and dance. York would be feed, I see, to make me sport. York cannot speak. <laughs> Unless he were a crown, a crown for York, and lords bow low to him. I'll do his hands whilst I do set it on. Aye, <laughs> marry, sir. Now looks he like a king. Aye, this is he that took King Henry's chair. And this is he with his adopted heir. And how is it that great Plantagenet his crown so soon and broke his solemn oath? As I bethink me, you should not be king till our King Henry had shook hands with death. Oh, tis a fault too, too unpardonable. Off with the crown! And with the crown, his head. And whilst we breathe, take time to do him dead. She wolf of France. <laughs> but worse than wolves of France, whose tongue more poisons than the adders. How ill beseeming is it in thy sex to triumph like an Amazonian trunk upon their woes whom fortune <laughs> captivates. But that thy face is lizard-like, unchanging, made impudent by use of evil deeds. I would a say, proud queen, to make thee blush. <laughs> Tis beauty that all of make women proud, but God, he knows. Thy share thereof is small. Tis virtue that doth make the most admired, the contrary doth make thee wondered at. Tis government that makes them seem divine, the want thereof makes thee abominable. Thou art as opposite to every good as the antipodes are unto us, or as the south to the septentrion. Oh! Tiger's heart wrapped in a woman's hide. How couldst thou drain the lifeblood of the child to bid the father wipe his eyes with all and yet be seen to wear a woman's face? Women are soft, mild, pitiful. Flexible, but thou stern, obdurate, flinty, rough, remorseless, bidst thou me rage? Why, and how thou hast thy wish? Have me weep. Uh, now thou hast thy will. Oh. These tears are my sweet Rutland's obsequies. And every drop cries vengeance for his death. Against thee, fell Clifford, and the false Frenchman. Shrew me, but his passion moves me so that hardly can I check my eyes from tears. That face of his, the hungry cannibals would not have touched, would not have stained with blood, but you are more inhuman, more inexorable, oh, ten times more. Than tigers of her Kenya. See, ruthless queen, a hapless father's tears. This cloth 
Thou dipst in blood of my sweet boy, and I with tears to wash the blood away. Take her with a napkin and go boast of this. Take the crown. And with the crown, my curse, and in thy need, such comfort come to thee, as now I reap at thy too cruel hand. Had he been slaughter man to all my kin, I could not for my life but weep with him to see how inly sorrow gripes his soul. Lord, weeping white, my lord of Exeter. Think but upon the wrong he did us all, and that will quickly dry thy melting tears. Here's for my oath, here's for my father's death. Here's to write a gentle hearted king. <laughs> Open thy gate of mercy, gracious God. My soul flies through these wounds to seek out. <laughs> oh, with his head, set it on your gaze, that you all may overlook. The town of York. I wonder how our princely father escaped, and whether he'd escaped away or no. Had he been slain, we should have heard the news. Hmm? Had he been tamed, we should have heard the news. Bore him in the thickest truth. A stubborn lion in a herd of needs. <laughs> See how the morning opes her golden gates and takes a farewell of the glorious sun. <laughs> how well resembles it the prime of youth, trimmed like a Junker, prancing to his love. Hmm. As on mine eyes, or do I see three suns? <laughs> hmm? eh? Three glorious sons. Each one a perfect sun. Not separated with the wrecking clouds, but severed in a pale, clear shining sky. I see, see. They join, embrace, and seem to kiss. As if they vowed some league inviolable. Now are they but one lamp, one light, one sun. In this the heaven figures some event. It is wondrous strange. But a like yet never heard of. I think it cites us brothers to the field. But we, the sons of brave Plantagenet, each one already blazing by our meads, should notwithstanding join our lights together and overshine the earth. Is this the world? Whate'er it bodes, henceforward will I bear upon my target three fair shining suns. Nay, bear three daughters. <laughs> <laughs> Why you leave, I speak it. You love the breeder better than the male. <laughs> <laughs> what art thou whose heavy looks foretell some dreadful story? Hanging on thy tongue. <laughs> and that was a woeful looker on. When as the noble Duke of York was slain. <laughs> Say how he died. For I will hear it all. Environed he was with many foes, but only slaughtered by the ireful arm of unrelenting Clifford and the Queen, who crowned the gracious Duke in high despite. And after many scorns, many foul taunts, they took his head. And on the gates of York they set the same, and there it doth remain. Clifford. Boisterous Clifford, thou slain the flower of Europe. 
I cannot weep, for all my body's moisture scarce serves to quench my furnace burning heart. Tears are for babes. Blows and revenge for me. Richard, I bear thy name. I'll avenge thy death. How now, fair lords? What fare? What news abroad? Why stand ye like soft-hearted women here? Oh, Warwick. Warwick. Our dear father is slain. Ten days ago I drowned these news in tears. Forthwith have I marched to join with you to make another head and fight again. Where lie your powers? But some six miles off. Then in this troublous time, what's to be done? Attend me, sirs. Attend me! The proud insulting queen, Clifford, and that Nestor Exeter have wrought the easy melting king like wax. And now to York, the crew of them are gone to frustrate both his oath and our aspires. Therefore, to York, come march with me amain, for thou shalt know this strong right hand of mine can pluck the diadem from faint Henry's head. Then, Warwick, on thy shoulder will I lean, and when thou fallst, as God forbid thee are, must Edward fall, which peril heaven forfend. Then, King of England, shalt thou be proclaimed in every borough as we pass along. Well, Clifford, when thy heart is hard as steel, as thou hast shown it plenty by thy deeds, I come to pierce it. Or to give thee mine. Stay you no longer dreaming of renown, but sound the trumpets and about our task. <laughs> of York. Yonder's the head of that arch enemy that sought to be encompassed with thy crown. Doth not its object cheer your heart, my lord? To see this sight, it irks my very soul. My gracious liege, this too much lenity and harmful pity must be laid aside. Ambitious York, did level at thy crown. Thou, being our king, blessed with a goodly son, did you consent to disinherit him? Were it not pity that this goodly boy should lose his birthright by his father's fault? And long hereafter say unto his child what my great-grandfather and grandsire got, my careless father fondly gave away. But Clifford, tell me, didst thou never hear that things ill got had ever bad success? I'll leave my son my virtuous deeds behind. Would that my father had left me no more. My lord, cheer up your spirit, your foes are nigh. And this soft courage makes your followers faint. You promise knighthood to our forward son. Unsheathe your sword and dub him presently. Edward, kneel down. Edward, arise a knight and learn this lesson. Draw thy sword in right. My gracious father, by your kingly leave, I'll draw it as apparent to the crown, and in that quarrel use it to the death. Why, that is spoken like a too old prince. How oh, now, my lord of Oxford? Well, commanders, be in readiness. For the band of 30,000 men comes Warwick with the new-made Duke of York. And in the towns, as they do march along, proclaims him king, and many fly to him. To rein your battle for the earth's hand. I would your highness would depart the field. The queen hath best success when you are absent. Aye, my good lord, and leave us to our fortune. Why, that's my fortune too, therefore I'll stay. Oh. 
Sergeant Henry, wilt thou kneel for grace and set the diadem upon my head, or buy the mortal fortune of the field? Go! Wait thy minion, proud, insulting boy. It comes to thee to be thus bold in terms before thy sovereign and thy lawful king. I am his king. He should bend his knee. I was adopted heir by his consent. Since when his oath is broke. And reason too. Who should succeed the father but the son? Cut on with words, my lords, and hear me speak. My liege, the wound that bred this meeting here cannot be cured by words. Therefore be still. Then, executioner, unsheathe thy sword. Aye, so we will. And here I unsheath mine to prove my father's right upon your head. Whoever got thee, there thy mother stands, for well I wot thou hast thy mother's tongue. But thou art neither like thy dam nor sire, but like some foul misshapen stigmatic. <laughs> Outcast of Naples, England's bloody scourge! <laughs> Shamest thou not, knowing from whence thou art extraught, to let thy tongue detect thy base-born heart? A wisp of straw were worth a thousand crowns to make this shameless callant know herself. For what hath broached this tumult but thy pride? Hadst thou been meek, our title still hath slept. Therefore in resolution I defy thee, not willing any longer conference, since thou deniest thy gentle king to speak. Hey, Edward! No, wrangling woman, will no longer stay. These words will cost... Ten thousand lives this day! <laughs> <laughs> contend with growing light. What time the shepherd, blowing of his nails, can neither call it perfect day nor night. Now sways it this way, like a mighty sea, forced by the tide to combat with the wind. Now sways it this way, like the self-same sea, forced to retire by fury of the wind. Sometime the flood prevails, and then the wind, now one the better, then the other best. So is the equal poise of this fell war. And so the poise, twixt York, and Lancaster. Here, on this mole hill, will I sit me down. To whom God wills there be the victory. For Margaret, my queen, and Clifford, too, hath chid me from the battle, swearing both they prosper best of all when I am thence. Would I were dead if God's good will were so. For what is in this world but grief and woe? Oh, God, methinks it were a happy life to be no better than a homely swain. To sit upon a hill, as I do now, 
to carve out dials quaintly, point by point, thereby to see the minutes how they run, how many make the hour full, complete, how many hours bring about the day, how many days will finish up the year, how many years a mortal man may live. When this is known, then to divide the times. So many hours must I tend my flock. So many hours must I take my rest. So many hours must I contemplate. So many hours must I sport myself. So many days my youths have been with young. So many weeks ere the poor fools will heen. So many years ere I may shear the fleece. So minutes, hours, days, months and years passed over till the end they were created would bring white hairs unto a quiet grave. What a life with this. How sweet. How lovely. Gives not the hawthorn bush a sweeter shade to shepherds looking on their silly sheep and doth a rich embroidered canopy to kings that fear their subjects' treachery. Oh, yes, it does. A thousandfold. It does. And to conclude, the shepherd's homely curds, his cold, thin drink out of his leather bottle, his wonted sleep under a fresh tree shade, all which secure and sweetly he enjoys, is far beyond the prince's delicates. His viands sparkling in a golden cup, his body couched in a curious bed, when care, mistrust and treason wait on him. Ill blows the wind that profits nobody. This man whom hand to hand I slew in fight may be possessed with some store of crowns. And I that happily take them from him now may yet ere night yield both my life and them to some man else as this dead man doth me. Who's this? God, it is my father's face. Oh, heavy times begetting such events. From London by the king was I pressed forth. My father, being the Earl of Warwick's man, came on the part of York, pressed by his master. And I, who at his hands received my life, have by my hands of life bereaved him. Pardon me, God, I knew not what I did. Pardon, Father, for I knew not thee. A piteous spectacle. Oh, bloody time. When lions war and battle for their dens, poor harmless lambs abide their enmity. Weep, wretched man. I'll aid thee tear for tear. 
and let our hearts and eyes like civil war be blind with tears and break or charged with grief. All that so stoutly has resisted me, give me thy gold, if thou hast any gold, for I have won it with a hundred blows. But let me see, is this our foeman's face? No. Oh, no. It is mine only son. <laughs> oh, pity God, this miserable age. What stratagems, how foul, how butcherly. Erroneous, mutinous, and unnatural. This deadly quarrel daily doth beget. Pity. Pity. Gentle heaven, pity. The red rose and the white are on his face. Whither one rose and let the other flourish. If you contend, a thousand lives must wither. I will my mother for a father's death take on with me and ne'er be satisfied. I will my wife for slaughter of my son shed seas of tears and ne'er be satisfied. How will the country for these woeful chances misthink the king and not be satisfied? Was ever son so ruled a father's death? Was ever father so bemoaned his son? Was ever king so grieved for subjects' woe? Much is your sorrow. Mine Ten times so much. I'll bear thee hence where I may weep my fill. For I have murdered where I should not kill. These arms of mine shall be thy winding sheet. My heart, sweet boy, shall be thy sepulchre. I'll bear thee hence and let them fight that will, for I have murdered where I should not kill. Sad-hearted men, much overgone with care. Here sits a king, more woeful than you are. Fly! All our friends are fled! Away! Oh, Edward and Richard! Like a waste of greyhounds having the fearful flying hare in sight, are at our backs, and therefore hence the maze. Away, for vengeance comes along with them. Come thou with me, lest they seize on your person. Let me die and let them fight that will. <laughs> for I have murdered where I should not kill. Here burns my candle out. I hear it dies, which whilst it lasted gave King Henry light. O oh, Lancaster, I fear thy overthrow more than my body's parting with my soul. The foe is merciless and will not pity, for at their hand I have deserved no pity. Brothers, fortune bids us pause. Some troops, pursue the bloody-minded queen. And thou, good Norfolk, take our swiftest horse and seek the king. Trust me, I'll find him out. What think you, George? Did Clifford fly with him? No, it is impossible he should escape. Your brother Richard marked him for the grave. <laughs> <laughs> Whose soul is that which takes its heavy leave? I see who it is. Now the battle is ended, a friend or foe, let him be gentle. Fuck that 
doom of mercy. What is Clifford? From off the gates of York, fetch down the head. Your father's head, which Clifford placed there. Instead whereof, let this supply the room. <laughs> <laughs> measure for measure must be answered. Secure since we have lopped off Lancaster's chief arm. <laughs> Richard, I will create the Duke of Gloucester and George of Clarence. Warwick as ourselves shall do and undo as him pleases best. Let me be Duke of Clarence, George of Gloucester. Hmm? For Gloucester's dukedom is too ominous. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a foolish observation. Richard be Duke of Gloucester. Now to London to see these honors in possession. From whence shall Warwick cut the sea to France and ask the Lady Bona for thy queen? <laughs> Bona? I'd leave her marry Margaret. <laughs> I'll wed no woman that doth please me not. Bona of France shall please thy kingdom, Lord. So shalt thou sinew both these lands together and shall confirm that peace my arms have wrought you. Then as thou wilt, Lord Warwick, let it be. For never will I undertake the thing wherein thy counsel and consent is wanting. Then set on, for if we slack this fair, bright summer's day, sharp winter showers will mar our hope for hay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by my faith, our sun shines threefold bright, and Tartan's battle, won by famous York, shall be eternized in all age to come. <laughs> Drums and trumpets, and to London all, and more such days as these to us before. <laughs> Brother of Gloucester, at Tartan's Field, this lady's husband, Sir Richard Gray, was slain. Oh. Ah. His lands then seized on by the conqueror. Her suit is now to repossess those lands. My dishonor to deny it, fellow. Oh, twin honest. But, uh, yet I'll make a pause. Yea, is it so? Then I see the lady has the same to grant before the king will grant her humble suit. He knows the game, how he keeps the wind. <laughs> Widow, we will consider of your suit. And uh, come some other time to know our mind. All right, gracious lord, I cannot brook delay. 
May it please your highness to resolve me now. And what your pleasure is shall satisfy me. Aye, widow, then I'll warrant you all your lands, and if what pleases whom shall pleasure you. Uh, lords, give us leave. I'll try this widow's wit. Now tell, madam, do you love your children? Aye, full as dearly as I love myself. And would you not do much to do them good? To do them good, I would sustain some harm. Then get your husband's lands to do them good. Therefore I came unto your majesty. I'll tell thee how these lands are to be got. What you command that rests in me to do. But you will take exception to my boon. No, gracious lord, except I cannot do it. Oh, well, I can't do what I mean to ask. Why, then I will do what your grace commands. He plies her heart, much rain wears the marble. As red as fire, nay, then her wax must melt. <laughs> Why stops my lord? Shall I not hear my task? An easy task. Tis but to love a king. That's soon performed, because I am a subject. Well, then. Thy husband's lands I freely give thee. I take my leave with many thousand thanks. But stay thee. Tis the fruits of love I mean. The fruits of love I mean, my loving liege. Aye, but I fear me in another sense. What love thinks thou I sue so much to get? My love till death, my humble thanks, my prayers, that love which virtue begs and virtue grants. No, by my troth I did not mean such love. Why, then you mean not as I thought you did. To tell thee plain, I ain't to lie with thee. To tell you plain, I had rather lie in prison. <laughs> well, then, thou shalt not have thy husband's land. <laughs> oh, my dear lord, this merry inclination accords not with the sadness of my suit. Please you dismiss me either with I or no. I, if thou wilt say I to my request. No, if thou dost say no to my demand. Then no, my lord, my suit is at an end. Not you, it's her brown. He is the bluntest wooer in Christendom. Say that King Edward take me for his queen. <laughs> Tis better said than done, my gracious lord. I am a subject fit to jest with all but far, and fit to be a song. Oh, sweet widow, by my state, I. Swear I speak no more than what my soul intends, and that is to enjoy thee for my love. And that is more than I will yield unto. I know I am too mean to be your queen, and yet too good to be your concubine. You cavil, widow. I did mean my queen. To agree, your grace, my son should call you father. Or no more than when my daughters call thee mother. Thou art a widow, thou hast some children, and by God's mother, I being but a bachelor, have other sons. <laughs> Why, it is a happy thing to be the father of the many sons, I'll answer no more, for thou shalt be my queen. Does the father now have done his shift? <coughs> ah, <laughs> brothers! <laughs> Um, you muse what chat we two have had? Uh, the widow likes it not, for she looks very sad. <laughs> <laughs> you think it's strange if I should marry her? To whom, my lord? <laughs> <laughs> Why, Clarence, to myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, jest on, brothers. <coughs> I can tell you both. Her suit is granted for her husband's lands. Widow, come you along. Lords, use her honorably. <laughs> I, Edward, will use women honorably. Would he were wasted, marrow, bones, and all, that from his loins no hopeful branch may spring to cross me from the golden time I look for. And yet, between my soul's desire and me, 
the lustful Edward's title buried. His Clarence, Henry, and his son, young Edward, and all the unlooked-for issue of their bodies to take their rooms ere I can place myself. A cold premeditation for my purpose. Why, then, I do but dream on sovereignty, like one that stands upon a promontory and spies a far-off shore where he would tread, wishing his foot were equal with his eye, and chides the sea that sunders him from thence. <laughs> my eye's too quick, my heart or weans too much, unless my hand and strength could equal them. Well, say there is no kingdom, then, for Richard. What other pleasure can the world afford? I'll make my heaven in a lady's lap. <laughs> and deck my body in gay ornaments and witch sweet ladies with my words and looks. Oh, miserable thought. And more unlikely than to accomplish twenty golden crowns. Why, love forswore me in my mother's womb. And for I should not deal in her soft law, she did corrupt frail nature with some bribe to shrink mine arm up like a withered shrub, to make an envious mountain on my back where sits deformity, to mock my body, to shape my legs of an unequal size, to disproportion me in every part, like to a chaos or an unlipped bear whelp that carries no impression like the dam. And am I then a man to be beloved? Oh, monstrous folk to harbour such a thought. Then, since this earth affords no joy for me but to command, to check, to all bear such as are a better person than myself, I'll make my heaven to dream upon the crown. And whilst I live to account this world but hell, until my misshaped trunk that bears this head be round impaled with a Glorious crown! And yet I know not how to get the crown. For many lives stand between me and home. And I, like one lost in a thorny wood that rends the thorns and is rent with the thorns, seeking a way and straying from the way, not knowing how to find the open air, but toiling desperately to find it out, torment myself to catch the English crown. And from that torment I will free myself. Or hew my way out with a bloody axe. Why, I can smile. And murder whilst I smile. And cry content to that which grieves my heart. And wet my cheeks with artificial tears. And frame my face on all occasions. I can add colours to the chameleon. Change shapes with Proteus for advantages. And set the murderous Machiavel to school. Can I do this and cannot get a crown? Tut, were it further off, I'll pluck it down. Under this thick grown brake will shroud ourselves, for through that land and on the deer will come. I'll stay above the hill so both may shoot. Oh, that cannot be. The noise of thy crossbow will scare the herd, and so my shoot is lost. Well, let's both stand here and aim we at the best. <laughs> and for the time shall not seem tedious, I'll tell thee what befell me on a day in this self place where now we make our stand. Here comes a man. Let's stay till he be passed. Scotland am I stolen, even of pure love, to greet my own land with my wishful sight. No, Harry. Harry, it is no land of thine. Thy place is filled. 
thy scepter run from thee, thy balm washed off wherewith thou wast anointed. No bending knee will call thee Caesar now, no humble suit oppressed to speak for right, for how can I help them and not myself? He is a deer who skins our keepers be. This is the Guantam King. Let's seize upon him a bit while we are a little more. My queen and son are gone to France for aid. And as I hear, the great commanding Warwick is thither gone to crave the French king's sister to wife for Edward. I see. What art thou that talkst of? Kings and queens. More than I seem, and less than I was born to, for men may talk of kings, and why not I? Aye. But thou talkst as if thou wert a king. Why, so I am. In mind, that's enough. Well, if thou art a king, where is thy crown? My crown is in my heart, not on my head, not decked with diamonds and Indian stones, nor to be seen. My crown is called content, a crown it is that seldom kings enjoy. Well, if you be a king crowned with content, Thy crown content, and you must be contented to go along with us. For as we think, you are the king King Edward hath deposed, and we his subjects sworn in all allegiance will apprehend you as his enemy. But did you never swear and break an oath? No, never such an oath, nor will not now. Where did you dwell when I was king of England? Here, in this country where we now remain. I was anointed king at nine months old. My father and my grandfather were kings, and you were sworn true subjects unto me. Say, therefore, have you not broke your oaths? No, for we were subjects, but whiles you were king. Why am I dead? Do I not breathe a man? Oh, simple man. You know not what you swear. Look. As I blow this feather from my face, and as the air blows it to me again, obeying with the wind when I do blow, yielding to the other when it blows, commanded always, by the greater ghast. Such is the lightness of you, common men. But do not break your oaths, for of that sin my mild entreaty will not make you guilty. We charge you then, in God's name and the King's, to go with us unto the officers. What God wills, I humbly yield unto. Queen of England. Welcome, Prince, and welcome, my Lord Oxford. Worthy Margaret, sit down with us as doth befit thy state. No oh, mighty King of France, our Margaret must strike her sail and learn a while to serve where kings command. I was, I must confess, great Albion's queen in former golden days, but now mischance hath trod my title down and with dishonor laid me on the ground where I must take like seat unto my fortune and to my humble seat conform myself. Whate'er thy fortune still be like thyself, come, sit thee by our side. Now, tell thy grief. We'll ease thee if we can. Then know my liege, 
My Henry is deposed and exiled. As proud, ambitious Edward, Duke of York, usurps the title and the regal throne. This is the cause that I, poor Margaret, am come to crave thy just and lawful aid. And if thou fail us, all our hope is done. Renowned queen, with patience calm the storm, while we do seek a means to break it up. But see where comes the breeder of our sorrows. Ah, now begins a second storm to rise. For this is he that moves both wind and tide. Welcome, brave warrior. What brings thee to France? From worthy Edward, king of Albion, I come in kindness and unfinished love. First to do greetings to thy royal person, and then to crave a league of amity, and lastly to confirm that amity with nuptial knot, if thou vouchsafe to grant him the virtuous Lady Bona, thy fair sister. If that go forward, Henry's hope is done. And gracious madam, in our king's behalf, I am commanded with your leave and favor, humbly to kiss your hand, and with my tongue to tell the passion of my sovereign's heart. Where fame, late entering at his heedful ears, hath placed thy beauty's image and thy virtue. King Lewis and Lady Bona, hear me speak. This suit springs not from Edward's honest love, but from deceit bred by necessity. For how can tyrants safely govern home, unless a war they purchase great alliance? Injurious Margaret. And why not queen? Because thy father Henry did usurp, and thou no more art prince than she is queen. Queen Margaret brings Edward and Oxford, vouchsafe at our request to stand aside while I use further conference with Warwick. Heaven grant that Warwick's words bewitch him not. Now Warwick, tell me, even upon my conscience, is Edward your true king? I swear he is. But is he gracious in the people's eye? The more that Henry was unfortunate. Then further, all dissembling set aside, tell me the measure of his love for Bona. Such as beseems a monarch like himself. Say, sister, what is your resolve in this? I must confess that often ere this day, when I have heard your king's desert recounted, mine ear hath tempted judgment to desire then warwick thus our sister shall be edwards draw near queen margaret and be a witness that bona shall be wife to the english king deceitful warwick it was thy device by this alliance to make void my suit before thy coming lewis was henry's friend and still is friend to him and margaret but if your title to the crown be weak then tis but reason that i be released from giving aid which late i promised it Yet shall you have all kindness at our hand that your estate requires, and mine can yield. Henry hath hid his exiled head in Scotland, where having nothing, nothing can he lose. And as for yourself, our quondam queen, you have a father able to maintain you, and better to her you troubled him than France. Troubled, set her up, and pull her down of kings. I will not hence. So with my talk and tears, both full of truth, I make King Louis behold thy sly conveyance and thy lord's false love. Warwick, there is some post to us or thee. Lord Ambassador, these letters are for you sent from your brother, Marquis Montague. These from our king and to your majesty. A matter of these for you, from whom I know not. I like it well that our fair queen and mistress smiles at her news while Warwick frowns as he is. Nay, mark how Lewis doth stamp as he were nettled. <laughs> Elbows for the best. <laughs> what are your news? <laughs> Mine? Such as fill my heart with unhoped for joys. Mine full of sorrow and heart's miscontent. What? Has your king married the Lady Grey? And now to soothe your forgery and his sends me a paper to persuade me patience? Dare he presume to scorn us in this manner? I told your majesty as much before this fool is Edward's love and Warwick's honesty. King Lewis, sir, I here protest in sight of heaven and by the hope I have of heavenly bliss that I am free from this misdeed, Edward. <laughs> no more, my king, for he dishonors me. <laughs> and to repair my honor lost for him, I here renounce him and return to Henry. 
My noble queen, let former grudges pass, for henceforth I am thy true servitor. Warwick, these words have turned my hate to love, and I forgive and quite forget old faults, and joy that thou art become King Henry's friend. So much his friend, that if it please his majesty to furnish me with arms and ships of war, I repart Henry in his former state, and force false Edward from his seat by war. Then England's messenger return in post, and tell false Edward, thy supposed king, that Louis of France is sending over maskers to revel it with him and his new bride. Tell him, in hopes he prove a widower shortly. I'll wear the willow garland for his sake. Tell him, my mourning weeds are laid aside, and I am ready to put armor on. Tell him from me that he has done me wrong. And therefore, I'll uncrown him ere to be long. There's thy reward. Begone. Now, Warwick, thou and Lord Oxford, with five thousand men, shall cross the seas and bid false Edward battle. And as occasion serves, this noble queen and prince shall follow with a fresh supply. God grant you fortune in this high attempt. I long till Edward fall by war's mischance for mocking marriage with a dame of France. Had he none else to make a stale but me, then none but I shall turn his jest to sorrow. I was the chief that raised him to the crown, and I be chief to bring him down again. Tis not his new-made bride shall succor him. Not that I pity Henry's misery, but seek revenge on Edward's mockery. Tomorrow, Brother Clarence. What think you of this new marriage with the Lady Grey? Has not our brother made a worthy choice? <laughs> you know it is not far from hence to France. Could he not wait till Warwick made return? Since he was king, I like not his proceedings. I hear, but speak not much yet. Think the more. Our brother's rash, yet not as rash as thou. Why, it is our blood. Am I impatient? Was our father so? It was apt in war, but now our wars are at the council board, where policy and patience must prevail. <laughs> Be like our brother's may, but not our own. I like it not he doth advance Lord Rivers and other upstart kinsmen of the Queen. Oh, why doth he so but to disfurnish us? Oh, this is the trick was fashions, I think, by Margaret against our royal father, who packed the council once with many and beers, to countercheck her mighty opposites. For <laughs> oh, where is talking about the king? Oh, I like to tell him plainly what I think. Good morrow, brothers. Ah. Pray you take your places and bid a welcome to her majesty and to her brother. Rivers, I sit you all, and let us look into our state affairs. Brother Clarence, why do you stand apart as you were pensive and half malcontent? <laughs> How like you of our noble choice in marriage? As well as Louis of France, or Warwick may, which are so weak of courage and in judgment that they'll take no offence at your abuse. Suppose they take offence without a cause. They are but Louis and Warwick. I am Edward. Your king, and Warwick's, and must have my will. Say, Brother Richard, are you offended too? Oh, not I. No, God forbid that I should wish thee severed whom God hath joined together. Aye, <laughs> and for pity to sunder them that yoke so well together. <laughs> Setting your scorn and your mist-like aside, tell me some reason. Why the Lady Grace should not be Edward's wife and England's queen? Then this is my opinion. 
that King Louis becomes your enemy for mocking him about the marriage of the Lady Boda. And Warwick, doing what you gave in charge, is now dishonored by this new marriage. Suppose both Louis and Warwick be appeased by such invention as I can devise. Yet to have joined with France in such alliance would more have strengthened this our commonwealth against foreign storms than any home-bred marriage. Oh, why, know you not, my lord, that of itself England is safe? If true, within itself, the Aye. safer Hastings went as backed with France. Which is better using France than trusting France. True, my lord. Let us be backed with God and with the seas, which he hath given us for fence impregnable, mm. and with their helps only defend ourselves. In them and in ourselves, our safety lies. Well said, Lord Hastings. Now, brother, leave these looks and let us to our present business. Ere yet we leave debate of marriage questions, please you to answer to my own disgrace. Oh, what mean you? Not by my fate, but you grow I was defiance to Lord Scales' daughter, and now I hear that you have offered her to Rivers here. Now, why should you thus advance the house of Woodville and debase your own? Belike the lady doth prefer me to thyself. <laughs> <laughs> Alas, poor Clarence. <laughs> Is it for a wife that thou art malcontent? Ah. <laughs> I will provide thee. Oh. <laughs> In choosing for yourself, you showed your judgment. Which being shallow, you shall give me leave to play the broker in my own behalf, and to that end I shortly mind to leave you. Leave me or tarry. Edward will be king, and not be tied unto his brother's will. My lords, before it pleased his majesty to raise my state to the title of a queen, do me but right, and you must all confess that I was not ignoble of descent, and meaner than myself have had like fortune. But as this title honours me and mine, so your dislike to whom I would be pleasing that cloud my joys with danger and with sorrow. Oh, my love, forbear to fawn upon their frowns. What danger or what sorrow can befall thee, so long as Edward is thy constant friend? My lord. Oh, how now, Lord Buckingham? <laughs> was that late that I was greet the morning with such looks? So please, your majesty. I myself was long abed, and yet I'm here by time. <laughs> Lord, there's letters brought to you from France that do import such peril and such ill that I have lingered hence to question those that fetch them hither. Oh, well, what do they import? Warwick is so incensed at your marriage that he has sworn to be revenged on you. Ha! <laughs> Why, what of that? How should he be revenged? His powers lie in England all dispersed. French King Louis have furnished him with more, and he is joined with Margaret and Prince Edward. It's not possible. It's most certain. For hither what he bends is desperate sail. Well, let him sail on. <laughs> he sails towards the rocks. <laughs> <laughs> this jesting that will fit the time. For he himself's a rock that's like to rend thine own great bark. Therefore prepare yourself. He swears, and you have done him bitter wrong, he will uncrown you and restore your foes. What? Death the traitor breathe out so proud words? <laughs> the wind doth change, brother. The wind doth change. Well, I will arm me. Being thus forewarned, they shall have wars and pay for their presumption. Say, is Warwick friends with Margaret? Aye, Clarence, for they're so linked in friendship that young Prince Edward marries Warwick's daughter. Then, brother king, farewell and sit you fast. For I will hence to Warwick's other daughter, that though I have won a kingdom, yet in marriage I may not prove inferior to yourself. All those that love me and Warwick, Follow me. <laughs> Will surly Clarence join the traitor, Warwick? So the haste is needful in this desperate case. Norfolk, Rivers, you and our behalf go levy men and make prepare for war. Myself will straight follow you. But before you go, Good Buckingham and Hastings. Resolve my doubt. You, of all the rest, are nearest to Warwick by blood and by alliance. Then tell me if you love him more than me. Hmm? For if you do, then get thee hence with Clarence. But if you mind to hold your true obedience, give me assurance with some friendly vow that I may never have you in suspect. So God help Hastings, as he proveth true. Thou mayest trust Buckingham, my sovereign liege, as much as he doth trust his dearest friend. Whenever I prove false to you or yours, then doom me to the death. Amen, amen.
Now, Brother Richard, will you stand by us? Aye. <laughs> Despite of all that shall withstand you. <laughs> My gracious sovereign. Henry, your foe is taken and brought your prisoner to your palace gate. <laughs> Why, show that I am sure of victory <laughs> till you be conveyed unto the tower. Can Richard let us hence and lose no hour till we meet Warwick with his foreign power? <laughs> Trust me, my lord, all hitherto goes well. The common people by numbers swarm to us, and hitherward comes Clarence to our aid. Lord, the trust that we repose in you exceedeth that we may assign to Clarence. He has betrayed his brother and me thee. Well, I will watch him. This is but politic. <laughs> Thinks thou that Warwick lacketh policy. His present aid will speed our sure success. And as we speed, he'll cleave to me the more. See where he comes. I pity, fear him not. Welcome, good king. Welcome unto Warwick. Thanks, mighty lord, that makes and unmakes kings. Knowest thou my brother's army lies at hand? Aye, shortly do we mean to set on it. Uh, to it straight and trust my servant counsel. Edward is rash and carelessly encamped. Twere easy now beneath night's coverture, his soldiers lurking in the towns about, and here attended by a simple guard, by swift surprise to take him at our pleasure. Our scouts have found the adventure very easy. Come, we'll about it. And good Clarence. Know for thy good help I'll ever favor thee, in sign of which my daughter shall be thine. I thank thee, and embrace thy warlike hand. Clarence will hold with thee whate'er befall. <laughs> Nothing but good, my lord, will ever befall us. Within the hour, Edward will be our thrall. <laughs> Let us in silence now and round his camp. And when he has reposed himself to sleep, and his few sentinels nod by their fires, then suddenly we will descend on him. You that will follow me in this attempt, applaud the name of Henry with your leader. Each man take his stand. The king by this has set him down to sleep. Faith, I am weary of these watching hours. Thinks thou these wars will ever have an end? Not till each proud, ambitious peer in England has slaughtered one another. <laughs> Why then? Tis like these wars will long continue. So I hope. I have more peace in them than ever at all. To sleep at home no more than in a field. Faith, I must have brawling wife. For sleep, methinks I have as much as doth the king. They say kings watch more long than watchmen do. But say, I pray, what nobleman is that that with the king he arrested in his tent? It is the Lord Hastings, the king's chief as friend. Oh, is it so? But why commands the king that his chief followers lodge in town about him whilst he himself keeps in a cold field? Which is the more honour, because more dangerous. Oh, give me slumber, man, and quietness. I like it better than a dangerous honour. A quiet deed, not a... Faith, my head doth nod. And so doth mine. And mine. Then hang the honour. Good night, good fellows. Good night. Shall be ours. 
What did they imply there? Richard and Hastings, let them go. Here is the Duke. The Duke? Why, Warwick, when we parted, thou course me king. Aye, but the case is altered. <laughs> When you disgraced me, my embassy, then I degraded you from being king and come now to create you Duke of York. Alas, how should you govern any kingdom that know not how to use ambassadors, nor how to shroud yourself from enemies, nor how to be contented with one wife, nor how to use your brothers brotherly. Yea, brother of Clarence, art thou here too? Why then I see that Edward needs must die. Yet Warwick, in despite of all mischance of thee, thyself, and all thy accomplices, Edward will always bear himself as king. And then in his mind to be Edward England's king. But Henry now shall wear the English crown and be true king indeed. Thou but the shadow. What fate imposes, men must needs abide. It brooks not to resist both wind and tide. Now remains, my lord, for us to do, but march to London with our soldiers. Aye, that's the next thing that we have to do. To free King Henry from imprisonment and see him seated in the regal throne. Who's there? Lord Rivers. What makes you in this sudden change? Oh, Brother Rivers, are you yet to learn what late misfortune has befallen King Edward? Oh, loss of some pitched battle against Warwick. No, but the loss of his own royal person. My sovereign slain. I almost slain, but he's taken prisoner. Yes, I must confess, he's full of grief. Yet I'd rather wean me from despair for love of Edward's offspring in my womb, bearing with mildness my misfortune's cross, lest with my sighs or tears I blast or drown King Edward's fruit, true heir to England's crown. But where is Warwick then become? I'm informed that he has come to London to set the crown once more on Henry's head. Therefore, I'll hence unto the sanctuary. Come, Rivers, let us fly while we may fly. If Warwick takes us, we are sure to die. King Henry, now thou art a king new made. How likest thou to breathe the air again of your enfranchised kingdom? Well enough, and yet tis strange, but since I lay within this blessed tower, I knew more quiet than air upon my throne, for which I render thanks to thee, Lieutenant, and to my God. I have cold thanks. Oh, I warwick tis thou that after God has set me free. He was the author, thou the instrument. Now that I may conquer fortune's spite by living low, where fortune cannot hurt me, I will resign my government to thee. Be thou as Humphrey was, my lord protector. Why then, though loath, yet I must be content to be the shield, the bulwark, and the armor to Henry's body, and supply his place. Supply his place. What meaneth you by that? I mean in bearing weight of government. And to that end, now is it more than needful, forthwith that Edward be pronounced a traitor, and all his lands and goods be confiscated. What needeth that? Must he be so debased? My lord, I mean not so to debase your brother, so much as to secure King Henry's throne. Well, that's done if the succession be determined. Aye. Therein, Clarence shall not want his part. My lord of Exeter. What youth is that of whom you seem to have so tender care? My liege, it is your cousin, Earl of Richmond. Come hither. The 
England's hope. If secret powers suggest but truth to my divining thoughts, this pretty lad may prove our country's bliss. His looks are full of peaceful majesty, his head by nature framed to wear a crown, his hand to wield a scepter, and himself likely in time to bless a regal throne. Make much of him, my lords, for this is he must help you more than you are hurt by me. I knew that Edward is escaped and fled to gather powers in Burgundy. Unsavory news. But how may he escape? He was conveyed there by Richard, Duke of Gloucester, and the Lord Hastings who attended him. Now did he gather head, and means to march with swift dispatch for your grace in London, and many giddy people flock to him. Let's levy men and beat him back again. In Warwickshire I have true hearted friends, those will I muster up. And thou, son Clarence, shall stir up gentlemen to come with thee. In Oxfordshire I muster up my friends. Then Henry, with the loving citizen, shall rest in London until we come to him. Farewell, sweet lord. Let's meet at Coventry. Huh. A sign of truth, I kiss your highness' hand. Well-minded Clarence, be thou fortunate. Yeah, good Exeter and Oxford, counsel me. Where think you now I should dispose myself for safety in this latest exigent? No matter where, so you will remain in London. Why then, I'll back and keep me in the tower. The tower? Why, it is a sanctuary where I will pray and meditate in quiet for Warwick's good success. And for your own. Farewell, kind friends. When these new wars are done, then will I once again into the sun. Farewell, my sovereign. And farewell, Lancaster. Why do you frown and speak so fearfully? What ill do you portend? But you are so ill. And yet my mind misgives me in these conflicts what may befall King Henry and his heirs. Therefore, Lord Oxford, to prevent the worst, forthwith I'll bear this boy to Brittany, to keep him safe until these storms be past. For howsoever our house may hold its own, Warwick can never keep the throne secure. For if, as I misdoubt, he doth prevail, the ill-starred king is fated still to fail. Nay, God forbid. Word. Should we yet suppose that God doth favor our bloody rose? I am a weary lord of heavenly hoping. Yet have I still some hope in this same boy, whom I do mean to cherish and to tutor, in hope that I may rear a phoenix and shall prove a blessed breeding hope to us. A boy. To Brittany. There must we wend. You to our hopes. And I unto mine end. God prosper Richmond. And King Henry too. There's naught for Henry, boy, that we can do. desired help from Burgundy. Hey, thus far, fortune maketh us amends, and says that once more I shall have to change my waned state for Henry's regal crown. And yet methinks we need more help than this, ere traitorous Warwick may be overthrown. Doubt not, but many friends will join with us. The mighty Duke of Buckingham makes head. Think you he will fight upon our part? Let he come and challenge his allegiance. Welcome, great Duke. Why come you now in arms? To help King Edward in his time of storm. Thanks, Buckingham. But now we do forget our title to the crown and only claim our dukedom. Till God please to send the rest. 
Then join with us and we'll debate a while by what safe means the crown may be recovered. What talk are you debating? In few words, if you will not proclaim yourself our king, I will be gone. Nick Buckingham, why should we fight if you pretend no title? When we grow stronger, then we'll make our claim. Then tis wisdom to conceal our meaning. We, with scrupulous wit, now arms must rule. I, fearless minds, climb soonest unto crowns. Well, be it as you will. For tis my right. And Henry but usurps the diadem. Oh, now my sovereign speaketh like himself. But now I will be Edward's champion. What say you all? Shall we proclaim him king? Aye. Sound trumpets. Edward shall be here proclaimed. Long live Edward the Fourth! Long, Long live, live Edward the Fourth! Thanks to you all. If fortune serves me, I'll requite this kindness. I think we have in this brave Buckingham a second warrior, <laughs> but more loyal one. <laughs> I can't so easily you make a king. Now, naught remains but that we scotch this Warwick. Though you understand the walls of Coventry that muse him up, which we must needs throw down. Go trumpet to the walls and sound a pile. Edward, come. What wouldst thou, boy? Old Warwick, wilt thou ope the city gates, call Edward king, and at his hands back mercy? Say rather wilt thou draw thy forces hence. Confess who set thee up and plucked thee down, and thou shalt still remain the Duke of York. I thought at least he would have said the king. Nay, Henry is my king, Warwick his subject. But Warwick's king is Edward's prisoner. He hit him in the tower, and there we seized him. So, gallant Warwick, do but answer this. What is the body when the head is off? I am the head, the body, and the limbs of Lancaster. <laughs> and for my lawful king, I will reseat him as I did yourself. Lo now, where George and Clarence sweeps along, with whom an upright seal to right prevails, more than the nature of a brother's love. Come, Clarence, come. Thou wilt, if Warwick call. Stay, Clarence. Stay. Thou wilt, and Edward call. I trow thou art not so unnatural to bend the fatal instruments of war against your brother and your lawful king. Whate'er the injuries are thus supposed unto thee, is this thy remedy? to join a desperate and weakly traitor whose present powers are insufficient to save him from deserved overthrow. Oh, I think you I am come but to confound him. Ill-fated, Warwick, know you what this means? Look here, I throw my infamy at thee. Passing traitor, perjured and unjust. I will not ruinate my father's house. And I'm so sorry for my trespass made, that to deserve well at my brother's hands, I here proclaim myself thy mortal foe, and to my own new turn my blushing cheeks. Pardon me, Edward. I will make amends. And Richard, do not frown upon my faults, for I will henceforth be no more unconstant. <laughs> well, so good, Clarence. This is brother by I welcome more, and ten times more beloved than if thou ever hadst deserved our hate. Say, Warwick, wilt thou yield unto our mercy? Come, sirrah, take the time. Kneel down, kneel down. Nay, when? Strike now, or else the iron cools. I had rather chop this hand off as a blow, and with the other fling it at thy face, than bear so low a sail to strike to thee. Hold I this city till Queen Margaret come, and then have at you, little lords of York. Sail how thou canst, 
Have wind and tide, thy friend. This hand, fast wound about his iron hair, shall, while his head is warm, and you cut off, write in the dust this sentence with his blood. Wind changing Warwick, now can change no more. Lords, to the walls. Me, friend or foe, and tell me who is Victor, York, or Warwick. Why ask I that? My mangled body shows that I must yield my body to the earth. <laughs> now is my state, as was the maid Pucelles, who perished on a coward Frenchman fled. Or as brave Talbots, when he was forsook by Somersets and Yorks, little dalliance. <laughs> Mythics, they mock me by the river Styx and laugh aloud to see my great aspires achieve no better fortune than their own. <laughs> Thus yields the cedar to the axe's edge, whose arms give shelter to the princely eagle and was a while the highmost tree in England. His eyes that now are dimmed with death's black veil have been as piercing as the noonday sun to search the secret treasons of the world. Wrinkles in my brows now filled with blood were likened oft to kingly sepulchres. For who lived king while I could dig his grave? Oh, now my glory smeared in dust and blood. Why, what is pomp, rule, reign, but earth and dust? And live we how we can, and yet die we must. Now, please, we brothers. The field is surely ours. <laughs> Aye, brother, look up for the kingmaker. <laughs> His vaunting mind would trouble us no more. <laughs> Lie thou there. Die thou, and die off here. For Warwick was a bug we all did fear. <laughs> <laughs> Wind changing Warwick now can change no more. Yet in the midst of this bright shining day, I spy a black, suspicious, threatening cloud. I mean, brothers, those powers the Queen hath raised in Gallia have arrived our coast. Ah, little and as girl, I... we'll soon disperse that cloud. We are advertised by our loving friends that they do hold their course toward Tewkesbury. 
We, having now the best at Coventry, will thither straight. For willingness rids way. Strike up our drums, cry courage, and away! Sit and wail their loss. The cherry seek how to redress their harms. Stay Warwick with your anchor. What of that? And Clifford was your topmast. What of him? Have we not Oxford here another anchor? And Ned, brave Ned, another goodly mast. We will not from the helm to sit and we but keep her course though the rough wind says no from shelves on rocks that threaten us with wreck for what is edward but a ruthless sea what clarence but a quick sand of deceit and richard but a ragged fatal rock say you can swim alas tis but an hour tread on the sand why dare you quickly sink this tried the rock the tide will wash you off. To speak I, sirs, to let you understand in case some one of you would fly from us. And there's no hope for mercy with the brothers. Methinks a woman of this valiant spirit should, if a coward heard her speak these words, infuse his breast with magnanimity. I, he who will not fight for England's hope, go home to bed. And like the owl by day, if he arise, be mocked and wondered at. Fair you, Lord, for Edward is the time. It's not this. It's his policy to haste thus fast and find us unprovided. But he's deceived. We are in readiness. It cheers my heart to see your forwardness. Lord! Knight and gentlemen! What I would say, my tears gains it. For every word I speak, you see, I drink the water of my life. Therefore, no more but this. Henry, your king, his prisoner to the foe, his state usurped, his realm a slaughterhouse, his subject slain, and yonder. It's the wolf that makes the spoil. Ah, oh, brave followers. Yonder stands the thorny wood, which, by heaven's assistance and your strength, must by the roots be hewn up yet ere night. I think that have more fuel for your fire, for while I watch ye blaze to burn them out, give signal to the fight. Now, 
here a period of tumultuous broils. Brother! Prince Edward and the Queen are taken! <laughs> Why then, the, the roots, the branches, and the bumps supporting Lancaster are quite cut down! <laughs> Bring forth young Edward. Let us hear him speak. <laughs> <laughs> What satisfaction canst thou make to us for bearing arms and stirring up my subjects? Speak like something proud, ambitious York. Suppose that I am now my father's mouth. Resign thy chair and where I stand kneel thou. <laughs> Whilst I propose the selfsame words to thee which Traitor, thou wouldst have me answer to. Oh, had thy father but been so resolved. <laughs> For God's sake, take away this captive scold. <laughs> hey, take away this scolding crook back, rather. What? I'm so young a thorn begin to prick. Now, peace, willful boy, or I will charm my tongue. <laughs> 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 and thou perjured George, and thou misshapen dick, oh. <laughs> I tell ye all I am your better, oh. traitors as ye are, <laughs> and thou shalt my father's right and mine. What has my mother taught thee thus to rail? <laughs> 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 I can't in return! And that's for twitting me with perjury! Take this to end thy terrible! Then kill me! Very unsound! Oh, for we have done too much! What should she lift up from the world with words? What does she swoon? Use means for her recovery. Oh, Clarence, excuse me to the king, my brother. What? I'll hence to London on a serious matter. What? A tower. To thy mother, boy. Canst thou not speak? <laughs> Traitors. Murderers. Butchers and villains. Bloody cannibals. How sweet a plant is thou unkindly quaff. You have no children, butchers. If you had, the sight of this would have stirred up remorse. But if you have a chance to have a child, look in his youth to have him so cut. Away with her. Go bear her hence for force. Never bear me hence. Dispatch me here. Here sheath thy sword. I'll pardon thee my death. <laughs> what wilt thou not? And Clarence, do it thou. By heaven, I will not do thee so much ease. Good Clarence, do. Sweet Clarence. Do thou do it? Didst thou not hear me swear I would not do it? Aye, but thou usest to forswear thyself. T'was sin before, but now it is charity. <laughs> what wilt thou not? Why is that devil's butcher hard favoured, Richard? Richard! Where art thou? Doth no man here dare give me my despair? Oh, away, I say, I charge you, bear her hence. So come to you and yours, as to this prince. Whew. 
Where's Richard gone? To London. All in post, and as I guess, to make a bloody supper in the tower. He's sudden when the thing comes in his head. Then march we hence. This drives a common salt with pay and thanks, and thence to London. And see our gentle queen, how well she fares. By this I hope she hath a son for me. such as I never saw in any charge I have all watched since I have kept this place. Is Tommy were not happier in heaven? He thinks I do misdoubt your grace's will. And your mistake is from my own despair at all the bitter workings of the world that I am come to have some confidence with this good saint. Don't lower at me. I would but share a little holy quiet with your thrice blessed charge. Come, bring me to him. Have you a warrant for to visit him? <laughs> it's a warrant, Nay, sir. Then. Thank you. I may obtain one easily enough, whether to visit him or apprehend to where presumes to cross my purpose. Well, my lord. Thanks for your pains. Well, my lord. I think, but dare not speak. That others strive, my comfort is that I am still alive. Good day, my lord. your book so hard? Aye, my good lord. My lord, I should say rather. What scene of death has Roscius now to act? <laughs> ah, suspicion always haunts the guilty mind. The thief doth fear each bush an officer. The bird that hath been limed in a bush with Trembling wings misdoubt of every bush. Of guilt, methinks, my mind is free enough, but for your own, tis for yourself to question. Say, wherefore hast thou come? Is it for my life? Thinks thou I am an executioner? A persecutor, I am sure thou art. If murdering innocents be executing, why then thou art an executioner? And thus, I prophesy that many a thousand that now mistrust no parcel of my fear, and many an old man sigh, and many a widow's, and many an orphan's water standing eye, men for their sons, wives for their husbands, shall rue the hour that ever thou wast born. Thy mother felt more than a mother's pain, and yet brought forth less than a mother's hope. To wit, an indigested and deformed lump, not like the fruit of such a goodly tree. Teeth hadst thou in thy head when thou wast born, which signifies thou camest to bite the world. And if the rest be true that I have heard, thou camest to... I'll hear no more. Die, prophet, in thy speech. <laughs> For this amongst the rest was I ordained. I and 
for much more slaughter after this. Oh God, forgive my sins and pardon thee. Will the aspiring blood of Lancaster sink in the ground? I thought it would have mounted. See how my sword weeps for the poor king's death. Oh, may such purple tears be always shed from those that wish the downfall of our house. Hmm. If any spark of life be yet remaining, down, down to hell. And say, I sent thee thither. Try! Oh. Oh. I have neither pity, love, nor fear. Indeed, tis true that Henry told me of. For I have often heard my mother say I came into the world with my legs forward. Had I not reason, think ye, to make haste and seek their ruin that usurped our right? The midwife wondered and the women cried, Oh, Jesus, bless us, he is born with teeth. And so I was, which plainly signified that I should snarl and bite and play the dog. Though yet I am not looked on in the world. The shoulder was ordained so thick to heave, and heave it shall some weight, or break my back. Then, since the heavens have shaped my body so, let hell make crooked my mind to answer it. I had no father. I am like no father. I have no brother. I am like no brother. And this word love, which graybeards call divine, be resident in men like one another. Not in me. I am myself alone. King Henry and the prince's son are gone. Clarence, I turn is next and then the rest. I'll throw thy body in another room. And triumph, Henry. In thy day of doom. <laughs> <laughs> Once more, we sit in England's royal throne. <laughs> Repurchased with the blood of enemies. What valiant foemen, like to autumn's corn, have we mowed down in tops of all their pride. Uh, come in, the best. Let me kiss my boy. Young Ned. For thee, thine uncles and myself, have in our armors watched the winter's night, <laughs> went all afoot in summer's scalding heat, <laughs> that thou mightst repossess the crown mm, in peace. And of our labors, thou shalt reap the gain. I'll blast his harvest when his head is laid. Work thou the way, and I shall execute. Clarence and Gloucester, love my lovely queen. And kiss your princely nephew, brothers both. <laughs> the duty that I owe to your majesty, I seal upon the lips of this sweet thing. Thanks, <laughs> Mr. Clarence, worthy brother Sam. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Of the tree from whence thou sprangst. Witness the loving kiss I give the feet. Now my seat it is my soul delights, having my country's peace and brother's loves. This deep delight doth crave our loving thanks to all who helped us to our happy throne. Lord Rivers. 
Thanks for thy good strokes at Tewkesbury. Lord Norfolk, thanks for thy good cheer at Coventry. <laughs> Lord Hastings, our especial thanks to you for freeing us when we were Warwick's thrall. Yet Brother Clarence, none here in this presence deserves our thanks more copiously than thou for that brave rescue you accomplished when Oxford had me down and would have slain me. <coughs> and for the last, <laughs> our thanks to thee, dear Gloucester, <laughs> our partner and our second in these wars. And now, our chiefest minister in peace. My love and duty to my lawful king. <laughs> oh, my lord of Buckingham! <laughs> we thank you well for urging us to reassert our title and mean to high advance you for your love. My love and duty to your majesty. Our I love and love duty, duty to your majesty. majesty. We thank you all. What further business must be dispatched today? Now, when it is done, let us enjoy our unaccustomed ease and bid our armor rust while we do revel in celebration of this hard-won peace. No business of note, saving one trifle. Uh -huh. What will your grace have done with Margaret? <laughs> oh, away with her. <laughs> Waft her hence to France. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a weary of affairs of state. <laughs> and now what rests but that we spend the time with stately triumphs, mirthful comic shows, <laughs> such as befits the pleasures of the court. Sound, drums and trumpets, Farewell, Sar Annoy, for here, I hope, begins our lasting joy.